Hey everybody, this is Pastor Chris. I'm coming to you live from Lexington Park Baptist Church, and this is PC Studios. It is June the 1st, 2022. How in the world are you doing today? Listen, I had uh, a big blessing today. Before the program was on, I got a phone call from the Shepherds, uh, from Lee and from Barbara Shepherd, and I, I, I just wanted to shout out to, to him, Pastor uh, Leland uh, Shepherd was a pastor or associate pastor here at Lexington Park uh, years ago, and uh, it is good to to know that he has celebrated his uh, 93rd birthday, 93 ber years, um, and we just want to wish them a happy birthday, 93 years. Praise the Lord. Um, what, what an awesome, awesome thing. Uh, I got to see pictures of them going out to Olive Garden, so shout out to you shepherds if you're out there all the way over in California. We just want to shout out to you today, uh, their their brother and pastor, fellow pastor, co-worker in the, in the Lord. Happy 93rd belated happy birthday to you. Hey, um, so everybody, today we're going to start talking about Thessalonica. I know that just gets you excited, right? As we hear Thessalonica, you know, and you're like, what in the world? You know, and Thessalonica, whatever it is now, but it's Thessalonica. It's the same place on the Aegean Sea, right off the Mediterranean up in part of Greece, and um, it's, it was a very prosperous city in the day of Paul, underneath, obviously, the Roman Greco world. Um, it, it had a lot of good things going for it and a lot of similarities. So today what I want to do is I want to focus on the city itself, the life itself, and then tomorrow, and our conclusion is looking at the church and what happened in Acts chapter 17. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts 17. And I'm only going to really focus on the opening statement here in, ch in verse 1. After they passed through Amphipolis 
and Apollyana, they came to Thessalonica. And Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. So Paul knew there was an establishment of a presence of Jews who, so they would have, even though it was Greek, even though it was uh, a pagan area, he knew um, because there was a synagogue, there was an understanding of the Messiah, and he was praying because he's taking the gospel, right? Uh, we're beyond Acts 10. You know, Acts 2, where Pentecost comes out and the Jews all get the Holy Spirit. Acts 10 with Cornelius, Peter actually takes the gospel to the Gentiles through Cornelius. And so there's a second Pentecost, kind of, I call it. And now when you get to 17, Paul's done his first missionary journey. Now he's on a second missionary journey. He's planting churches. So he's looking, where is there, not just Gentile, but where is there a Jewish presence where I can teach? They already got an establishment to teach about the Messiah. Let me teach that the Messiah that I'm proclaiming to you is Jesus. And we see that, look, it says right there in verse 3, right, in verse 3, explaining, he talked in the synagogues for three weeks in Thessalonica, explaining and proving, explaining and proving, this is really important, explaining and proving. And what was he explaining and proving? The Messiah would suffer, he would rise from the dead. So Jesus Christ would die on a cross and would raise from the dead. And then it says, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you, he is the Messiah. So the message that Paul would bring to Thessalonica on all of his mission trips would be that this is the Messiah, Jesus. He would look for synagogues. So he found this prosperous city on, on the Aegean Sea, and he decides to go there. I, I'm assuming with this intent to establish brothers and sisters in Christ in homes, which would emerge into a church, right, because home churches, and it would merge into a church. He would teach in the synagogues, hoping that the Jews would receive Christ. And tomorrow we're going to talk about the makeup of the church. But today I just want to talk about the city itself. First of all, the city we're going to find out is filled with idols. We're going to find out that in the chapter 1 in 1 Thessalonians as they as this church has abandoned, we're going to find out three, three or four sermons from now, that they've abandoned idols. We know it's a place filled with idol worship. We know it's filled with paganism, secularism, a worldliness, ungodliness. It just They're just living like the world. Um, and it's a major city. They're built, built with commerce. It's also... Um, it was the the capital of this region. So, so it was. Uh, it had government, it had commerce, it had pagan worship. So there was a sense of worship. It had a synagogue in it. It had a. It was an. It was a very prosperous, growing city. When Paul gets here, it's a place where there's people. Then there's a growing number of people where the gospel can be shared. So a lot of times we look for cities where we can share the gospel. Um, so like any other city, I mean, we could compare it to like Baltimore. You know, it's filled with sin. It's filled with all kinds of stuff. People are just doing their own thing. You got all your worldliness. You know, you got the port there. So you got the docks down there. So you're dealing with that back 2,000 years ago, though. I, so it, it is different, but still, you got major roadways. It's a capital city. It's got these commerce going on. People are doing their business. They're going about their lives. They worship all these false gods of the Greek and world. And so, you know, so major trade routes are coming through there. It is a place where people would probably be drawn to, right? Maybe entertainment would be taking place. This is the kind of thing we would see even back then on, on their scale and their level, uh, this type of mentality. So they had belief in gods, they had idol worship that dominated the city, no doubt about it. And it was a city that was secular, and we will find out, as we hear the preaching of the gospel in Acts 17, if you, read, if you keep reading beyond what I preach, there was great hostility to the gospel. There's great hostility to Paul. These men who turned the world upside down, they didn't like it. They went after a family named Jason. Uh, they took him before the authorities. Um, you know, they just, they wanted them out of this area. They didn't want anything to do with Jesus and his gospel and this Messiah that Paul is preaching. And they were, they were aggressive and rioting and mobbing. We're going to speak some to that tomorrow. But for now, what I want you to see is the Thessalonica of that day. They, you know, the, the people there are just living life. And when I think of a place that would have riots when they disagree, mobs that would form, 
looting that would took place, shutting people down, cancel culture. They wanted to cancel out the gospel and Paul's speaking, these people that turn the world upside down. When we talk about a capital city, an influencing political city, an influencing commerce, prosperous place with so much entertainment to offer and activities, it was flourishing. That sounds like America today. Now, maybe not America of 1776, but the America that we have merged into. There's paganism, there's secularism, there's all kinds of ideologies and philosophies, there's false gods. We may not have actual idol worship, but we worship our activities, our ideas, our politics, uh, those type of things. Uh, we worship the law, we worship you know, our opinions. We, we have all the things that Thessalonica had, we have. There's hostility to the gospel. There's hostility to the church. If we are a true church of Jesus Christ, there is hostility towards you and me. We have to be prepared for this and realize this. Um, so when I, I'm excited because when we preach it on Thessalonica, to me, this is me. Now there may be scholars out there that disagree with my parallelism, right? I'm looking at parallel. I see in Thessalonica's day a parallel dimension, if you will, that's very similar to our day. Now, we're, we're on steroids. I mean, there's no doubt to me. <clears throat> but I, I, I think there is a religious undercurrent in our culture. There is a Judeo-Christian ethic, I think, that is founding in our nation. We've abandoned those religious roots, and we have all kinds of religions now that are here. We have all kinds of philosophies that are here, secularism, Nons, N-O-N-E-S, this growing number of people that have no affiliation to any faith. This is growing. Yeah, you still may have a third of the segment that will identify, or maybe more. Maybe a third, I'm going to be generous, that can affiliate with Christianity. I don't know how pure their Christianity is. We have about 10% of those that sit in the pews every week by Barna stats that actually have a biblical worldview. 40% of pastors, biblical worldview. The good news in Southern Baptist realm, 78% that were interviewed had a biblical worldview. So Southern Baptist is on extreme. I would imagine in the pews too, many, especially sitting under me, many of you have a biblical worldview. That was not existent in this day. They would have been secular and pagan, much like when you go into our culture today. They, people, and they're rejecting, they're hostile. Listen, people don't want to hear about Jesus. They don't want to see our Judeo-Christian ethic flourish in our nation. They don't want to hear our opinion on abortion or on gay marriage or on the LGBTQ movement or Black Lives Matter and say, hey, every life matters. They, they don't want to hear these things, right? And even Christians get caught up into these movements. That was no different in the day of Paul. And so as we talk about these things, I'm excited because this week we're going to talk about the blessed church. What's it look like to be a blessed church, a blessed church? What's, what's that even look like? Paul describes Thessalonica as that type of church. So we're going to talk about it. What's it look like for a church to be gospel-oriented? Thessalonica was that church. So also, what's it look for a church that looks to forward thinking to see Jesus return and be excited about it? That was Thessalonica. A lot of good things. Now, there's a lot of righteous issues I've been talking about, not the morality with them. But righteous, how do I just keep living rightly as I'm ready for God's return and not lose my focus on influencing society and culture? See, I just thought Jesus' return was imminent. So for us, we should believe that too. But still, what is imminent is our mission to share the gospel and imminent to influence society. Paul knew this. He targeted, I believe, Thessalonica was a city that is on purpose. I think maybe God's got Thessalonica in there because Thessalonica can teach us something. It can teach a, a modern day culture, industrialization in the world in which we live. We can learn from Thessalonica. We can learn what it's like to live in that kind of culture, pagan culture, and not give a care about their cultural ideologies, but only about the gospel and the return of Christ and influencing them. How can we do that? And so that's where we're going through for the next probably six months, I mean, I haven't had it forecasted totally out, but we're going to be in First and Second Thessalonians. That's a lot of Bibles to cover in sermons, covering, you know, even ch chunks of it. So we're going to be in these books for a while, but I think it's relative to the day in which we live. 
And so I want to lay this proper foundation, this idle place. They're focused on the second coming. The return of Jesus, they believe, is imminent. They're felled in a country, a place that's that's filled with idols. Society has rejected the gospel, doesn't want anything to do with God, especially these people that are turning that world upside down. There's misunderstanding about death and and how that applies, and, and Paul kind of has to write the church and explain you can grieve with hope because when you die, with you, you're with the Lord. And so this book centers around a proper understanding of living righteously and a proper understanding of waiting on the return of the Lord and bringing those two things together as we engage our culture. And that's where all roads meet at Thessalonica. And so maybe you're not in the geography or study of cities, but I hope that just caught your attention. All roads now lead us to Thessalonica. What can we learn from them in the, over these next six months? How can we learn to reject the false gods? How can we learn to reject the idols? How can we learn from them to say, I, we're going to preach the gospel even if you take me before the magistrates and the judges and you persecute me and you want to kill me? I'm still going to preach the gospel. How can we still prosper in a prosperous place and not let worldliness and materialism and commerce influence us? How can we not let the entertainment world overwhelm us? Like I see everybody, and I'm not against watching Maverick and seeing Top Gun. You know, I'm going to go see it eventually too, but that's, that's not our focus. The gospel is. Who cares ultimately if we never see Top Gun, right? I mean, the entertainment agency is not what we're into. It's the gospel agency that we're into. You know, education, we want people to be educated, but ultimately educated so they can understand the gospel and read the word of God so God can be in their life and change hearts. Evil in our society, we want to see the gospel penetrate that because, listen, why do shootings like Uvalde and Buffalo and other places, how does that even happen? Because people have the knowledge of evil and good, and men will choose evil. Some men will love darkness over light. And by the way, we all once walked in darkness, the Bible teaches us. We want to see lives changed, hearts changed, sinners repenting of sin and turning to Christ. How does sex abuse happen that we've seen in, in, in the churches and in our culture and, and sexual assault and all these type of crazy, heinous things that people do? Well, it exists because why? Sexual morality existed in Paul's day. It exists in our day. Paul writes about all kinds of forms of sexual immorality from sexual abuse to heterosexual sin that's cohabitating or homosexuality sin or pornography. Pornania is the word actually in the Greek, pornania. Um, you know, so we see these things, uh, strip clubs, we see these things in society and cultures all around us. That doesn't mean we engage them and entertain it. We need to live rightly in the day in which we live. So how can we do that? I think we can learn that from Thessalonica. That's, that's your pastor's intention is to help all of us traverse a world that's gone crazy. That's not much different than Thessalonica, uh, even here in Southern Maryland. Hey, listen, God bless you guys. I want to just uh, thank all of you, all of you that are out there today that have joined us. Um, thank you for being with me today. Don't forget if you've got tickets or if you don't, let, let it call the office. But um, we, we upsize the scale of the movie theater we're going to tonight. We'll be at the movie theater tonight at 7 watching Summer Camp by Skit Guys. It's going to be a great movie. So come on out. It's $6 a ticket. We've sold, I mean, we sold out the small theater. We had to upgrade to the bigger theater. And uh, we, we do need more people to come out and buy tickets if you can. we got 115 seats, I think it is. And I think we've sold about maybe 75 to 80, which is excellent, you all, excellent. So anyway, I hope to see more of you there tonight. Uh, call Nikki, just let her know. Hey, listen, that's all I've got for you today. Uh, just know this, God loves you, and so do I. And now you go have a great day. You take care.